You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And this teacher come fucking limping past and I said, and I turned, you got your shoes on the right feet. And you could see every teacher looking. And the next minute he fucking grabbed me, hit me with this book. And he had my head in a locker, smashing the locker on my head. Worst hiding I ever had up to that, up to that age. Like, and, and I remember first lesson back, two lads come up, and I, you know, haven't seen you all summer. Whacked me around the head, bang, smacked one. Fucking rolled over through this fucking door into a classroom. Fucking head button him and that. Like, what the fuck's happened here? This fucking I've only been off six weeks. He turned into a fucking lunatic. And I never got bullied, mate, from that day on. In the eighties, you know, it came out, and you know, there was people killed. People stabbed, slashed on a, on a weekly basis. You know, there was some games you'd see, you'd read in the paper, 22 people were slashed. Just why, you know, it, it's madness at the time, but at the time it was it was just how, how the game panned out and what was going on off the pitch panned out. And as they say, it did it. It absolutely it brought football to its knees and it killed it. Back two weeks in London, Crown Court, Southern Crown Court, it was. And this fucking judge was having none of it. Horrible bastard. And he sent us Gerald Butler, never forget it fucking sends us all to jail. And by then, all this strike was over, straight to Brixton. And trust me, mate, you don't want fucking 30 Everton on a wing in Brixton. It was fucking on top to fuck, mate. Proper on top. It was fucking evil. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got big Andy Nichols. How are you, Andy, boy? James, good, mate, good. Thanks good for having us on, pal. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Soon running out of guests here. <laughs> you've, um, football hooligan for, for over 30 years. You've um, wrote a book. Scally. 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 You wrote a book, Scally. Um, many been, years ago. Many years ago. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Um, you've been active in the Terences for so long that you are, you've been in prison. You've travelled all over Europe. You've had a... You got a life banned for following your beloved team Everton. You've been about it, Andy boy. How's how's life treating you? It's good now, mate. Um, like you say, I've got a. It's twenty years we say since Scally come out, and um, when it first came out, I I was I used to do a lot of writing for fanzines and stuff, and then when the book started hitting the shelves, different lads were doing them from different gangs and that and whatever firms, fucking crews, call them what you want. And I was approached to say, look, you know, we know you do a bit of writing, a bit of fanzines. Do you want to do this this book? And it was always like a book on my own life, not necessarily an Everett Newligan book, if you like. And I think that's why it did so well, because it, it was one of the best sellers that's, that's of that kind of ilk, which has been on the shelves. But when I sent it off, I think he wanted, fella, great fella Pete Walsh from Milo Books, gave me the contract, you know, six grand, write this, six grand. Like, you're fucking having a laugh, aren't you? Six grand. Right, and load it. I fucking have that, like. And then, obviously, money per book. And then um, I sent this off, and it was like, fucking, I find, I've always found writing very easy. I, I left school with not a fucking one, one, one O level I had. And I wasn't thick, don't get me wrong, I just had no interest. But I loved writing about football and that. And then I brought, I sent him these manuscripts off, and he was like, fucking hell, you know, I only, I only want 90,000 words. You've sent me 150,000 words here. It was about my life growing up, um, jobs abroad. There's a lot more to it than football. And he basically said, I'm not really interested in all that stuff. I want the football stuff. That's what's selling these books. And it's always been there. And it was that long ago with some one of them fucking floppy disks, not even on a, on a card or whatever mm. they call it now. And I've always kept that back. And then since the book come out, so much has gone on in my life. Next year's the 20th anniversary of, of the launch of Scally. And we were always going to do something maybe after 10 years, but the timing wasn't right. So next year, we've got our heads together and I'm bringing out the sequel of it after 20 years called uh, The Peaceful Hooligan, mm -hmm. which hopefully finishes off my life. Not literally, but as, <laughs> as someone who was, yeah, yeah. who was involved in that far too much, mm -hmm. if you like. Yeah. But with a lot of other stuff in it, you know, it's not just a football story. It's just, as you say, growing up life and, and, and stuff like that. So... I look at it now and I think, oh, can hell, you know, there's a lot of material there because as long as I can remember, I've just always been getting into trouble and that's gone right through my life up until a few years ago. 
Yeah. So like I say, you like a little bit of closure on it if you like. I'm 60 next year, and when that comes out there, that'll be closure. Case closed, move on, next chapter. No more books. Yeah. <laughs> I always go back to the start with my guest, Andy, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, well, it's uh, I could still get the stick off the likes of um, Billy and the lads. I'm I'm pure woolly back, mate. I was brought up in Flintshire. Um, grew up and was raised there. Me dad met me mum in the Air Force in the Second World War. She was a Flint girl. Me dad was um proud Englishman. He dumped everything, lived over there. Um, one of five kids, the youngest by a long way. I think three of me, uh, two brothers, two sisters. I can only remember me and me, me one older brother living at home. They'd all left by the time I'd, I'd kind of ever remember. Um, tough council estate in Flintshire. Same as most people have, who, who kind of lived the life we've lived. You know, it was tough, rough. You, you had to fight. You have to do a great deal. You know, I, no one had any money. You know, I, I see Marcus Rashford now and hats off to him. Championing child poverty. Fucking hell, like, I'd like to have seen him around in our day. That was child poverty, mate. You know, you'd be out all day without a fucking bag of crisps or something. Whereas nowadays, if, if your kid hasn't got a big phone, they look, they think you're in poverty. And um, it, it was tough, mate. And um, as you say, you know, we, we brought up and we basically from, the, from early on in life, you're like, beg, steal, borrowed, fought. Right through to school. Um, I went to school over that way and I fucking hated every minute of it, mate. I was just never one for... I don't know, being able to sit down and have some twat telling you, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And I'll be honest, the education system failed me miserably. Like, um, it was full of bullies and violent, violent people, you know, and that was the fucking teachers. It was, it was horrible and, and I just hated it. I couldn't wait to leave school. And um, I got me wish. Um, like I say, school, first memory of school I've got, there was a lad from out of state, Grey Ebbs. He, he sadly passed away, but he was a tough, tough lad. And um, this lot, this taught me a lot of respect. This and and obviously, you have to bring this into your life in the end because a lot of people who fall the wrong end of the law, if you like, they looked upon as as not very nice people. But I like to think as kids, we all had respect for older people. But I never forget about the second day in school. This lad said to me, "Ah, come here a minute, Graves." He was like a mentor for us. You know, the hardest lad in the school and that. It was this teacher, Mr. Baxter, they all come out of the staff room and he walked funny. We'd see him after the first day walking funny. And this guy I've said to him, just say when he goes past, sir, have you got your shoes on the right feet? And I was like, oh, he said, just fucking say it. All oh, right, he'd, 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 he'd say anything he'd say to do. And this teacher come fucking limping past and I said, all right, sir, have you got your shoes on the right feet? And you could see every teacher looking. And the next minute he fucking grabbed me, hit me with this book. And he had my head in a locker, smashing the locker on my head. Worst hiding I ever had up to that, up to that age, like. And um, they dragged him off. And, and this was fucking education, high school. You know, nowadays you'd be jail. But then anyway, they got him off and they fucking took me on. I forget, took me home in this old mini. And my old lady was going mad, fucking big eye on me, big lump on my head. And my dad came home and he went to see the careers master who lived up the road from us, a fella called Mr. Pusby. You know, he always remember these things. Yeah. And he come back, he says, right, I'm taking you to school in the morning. Fuck off to bed, get to bed. Went to bed, took me to school the next morning. And this fella had to come in with the headmaster and like a teacher's union fella, if you like. And I thought, fucking hell, yeah, I'm going to get fucked in here. And he said, first of all, can I apologise? And my dad said, no, leave it a minute. He said, apologise to Mr. Mr. Baxter, apologise to him. And I was like, come on, to apologise to him for what you said. I said, oh, sorry for what I said. And my dad says, right, come on, we're going. He'll never say that to you again. Get back to school. Oh, fucking hell. And it turned out this fella had been tortured by the Japs in the war and had all the screws on his nails and that, and that's what it was. And my dad, being a proud military man, was fucking, you know, he didn't, he, he thought I deserved that hiding, and he probably did. And it taught you an awful lot of the time there. Just got to have respect for these people. And that's my only... Like, memory I have of school in the early days, and I, I thought, oh, fuck this for the I'm fucking bothering with this place. Like, it's horrible. Were you fighting back then in schools with other people then? Yeah. Well, I mean, when when I, I remember when I started high school, I was pretty much the same size as everybody. 
And I mean, the first day we were there, we went there and some lad was bullying someone. And I remember just fucking headbutting this lad. Most days, you know, kids 11, you didn't used to headbutt, but I fucking headbutt. Cleaned this, <laughs> cleaned this twat, <laughs> cleaned him out. I, years <laughs> on, he's the other lad sadly died now. I, years on, I was mating him, Carl. And he was like, different different primary school, you know, mating. He was like, a bit of a... And I remember fucking planting the head on him and like, fuck off you. And then, do you know what, mate? For a couple of years, everyone was getting bigger and I didn't, I didn't fucking grow. And I was like the smallest in the year. And then as... As school got on further and further, I was like, I was getting fucking bullied. Every one of you had a bit of a knack with after the first year was coming back and haunting it. And I, I fucking hell, I had a tell, torrid time, mate. Just getting bullied left, right and centre. Of people who really, if you'd have stood up to, you'd have fucking wellied. Mm -hmm. But just didn't, you didn't have the balls to do it. And then, as luck happened, <laughs> it, it, it changed my life. I started going to the match, a lad a couple of years older. I was always a big Everton fan, but I never, ever went. It was like, you know, it was half an hour or 40 minutes away. I had to get there. And um, and I went. A couple of games, and oh, mate, it just blew me mind. The naughtiness of it, the smell, the horrible. It was fucking horrible. A few weeks before I went to my first Everton game, my brother-in-law was a big red, and he took me to Anfield. And we sat in the seats, and we were playing Stoke. And they won 2 1 Liverpool and um, Gordon Banks. It would have been that 10 1, but for Gordon Banks. And I remember coming out and he said, y You're a Liverpool fan now? Because he knew I was a bit of an Everton fan. And I said, No, Stoke, because of that fucking goalie. And he was like, Fucking wanker, you know. Waste of fucking three quid. That was taking it. And um, a couple of weeks later, I went to Everton. Never forget, they played Leeds. Leeds were unbeaten. Leeds were going for the league. And it was madness, mate. And I look back now and I think, Fuck. And I was hooked. From that first game, hooked just with a whole place. I mean, I love football, don't get me wrong. Football was something that I watched and, and admired, but the, the actual fucking buzz around the whole place and the naughtiness it just had me hooked straight away. And then we went to a few more games, and then that pre season, I, was, I left school and I was thinking, do you know what? I'm fucking going to football matches here where you can be seriously hurt. And I've got a couple of dickheads in woodwork putting fucking shavings down my neck and all that and fucking stand up to them. And I remember the first lesson back, two lads come up, and I, you know, I haven't seen it all summer, whacked me down the head, bang, smacked one. Fucking rolled over through this fucking door into a classroom, fucking head button him and that. I'm like, what the fuck's happened here? This fucking, it's only been off six weeks, it turned into a fucking lunatic. And I never got bullied, mate, from that day on. The mean? only way, mate, was to stand up to them. And they're horrible, horrible, horrible people. But I've just found school was full of it, mate. And I, and I hated every minute of it. When did you start getting involved in the violence at Everton? At the football. <clears throat> well, I mean, you're always just on the outskirts of it, aren't you? You know, you're kids, 13, 14, unless you're a big uni, you could, you could get seriously hurt. But you'd always have to be part of the, the little, your gangs going everywhere. And then we went, you know, we started going, I remember going to Bristol City, I was probably about 14, and we come out of the ground, and there was a massive kickoff. Maybe run over and give someone a kick up the arse or something. And then I think it was about the last year I was in school, 79, we went abroad on a pre season tour to Antwerp. And it was fucking bedlam, mate. That was a different level. It was absolute bedlam. Just the fact you went abroad pre season, there was no like police involved. And I come back from there thinking, Fucking hell, I want, I want more of that all the time. It was like an addiction. And it's, it's I don't know, people, I'm sure cleverer people than me have tried to explain it, and it's, it's just tough. It, it became an absolute addiction for me. We've had, you know, I've, I've watched some of your shows, make drugs, drink, gambling, whatever. Never, never really an addiction for me, that, but the buzz of the football and, and what went with it. And it's, at the end of the day, it, it was a bit of a youth culture, but, Unfortunately, you know, I, I look at it like the mods and rockers in the 60s. They fucked up everybody's weekends, didn't they? And, and, and did the same kind of thing. But they helped sell records, the music part. So people actually gained money from that culture. Mm -hmm. Whereas what we did, you know, I'll, I'll take no pleasure in saying it, brought football to its knees, didn't it? Killed the game. You, know, you've got, you see some of the attendances in the, in the, in the early 80s. Chelsea, 6,000. Everton, 8,000. Apart from the likes of Liverpool United that had massive 
support anyway, you know, but they still only get 25,000 sometimes because it, it, it was horrible, horrible places to go. And unfortunately, the culture regenerated, caused all that. And it did it one time and brought football to its knees. What's your first proper tear up you were involved in? Um, you know, probably I'd say Antwerp in 79. That was just, I say, all across the terraces. And then we started going. You know, Everton were a bit shit at the time, so we started going to some England games. So if some lads by us, because they were on the graft then, you know, there was lads from all over the country going away. And I remember Luxembourg about 81, 82, it might be. You know, it was just the first time I've ever seen, not just the police, but the Luxembourg army got chased. England were just relentless, looted, fucking took everything that wasn't nailed down, trouble between themselves. Mental, absolutely mental. If that happened in this day and age, mate, it would be just headline news in every country in the world, the behaviour in them days. And I say nothing to be proud of. It was just how it was in them days. Absolutely nuts. Is it in your book you says there was like a thousand of you at some games? A thousand. And one in ten carried a knife? Well, you know, I, th I think in, in, a, in a lot of clubs, there was an awful lot of, you know, nasty violence and... <clears throat> You see people now, they say knife crimes on, on, on the rise then, I think, particularly in the 80s. You know, in, in the 70s a little bit, it was more gangs and territory and taking ends and that. There wasn't that much kind of pure, nasty violence. In the 80s, you know, it came out and, you know, there was people killed. People stabbed, slashed on a, on a weekly basis. You know, there was some games you'd see, you'd read in the paper, 22 people were slashed. Just... Why? You know, it's madness at the time, but at the time it was it was just how, how the game panned out and what was going on off the pitch panned out. And as they say, it did it. It absolutely it brought football to its knees and it killed it. What was your what was your nickname? The cutters or something? What's it? Everton, yeah, there's it's a bit of it's a bit of a myth that there was a, we made a big flag once with the county road cutters on but that county roads and things. And that stuck, yeah. yeah. And it's a, it's a little bit of a myth that, but you know, there was lots of different What did that mean? Or the knife. Yeah, so the, the county road was where all the lads drank and that and mm. the cutters because if someone went down there they got cut. But it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a myth. <laughs> but it, a few people uh, made good money out of flags on it and badges, you know. Were you fighting every every game, Andy? Um, oh man, don't we? Yeah, well, in the eighties, you know, if if somebody brought a group of fans basically to any ground in any in any of the leagues, there'd be trouble, wouldn't there? So it didn't matter if it was Leeds, Birmingham, Everton, Wolves, Liverpool, Liverpool, Aston Villa, Man United, fucking Leeds. It was just, it was just mass disorder. And then you go to the likes of London and fucking hell, your day out in London would be like a Beano summer special. You know, you'd be going there and you'd, you'd fucking hell, there'd be six or seven clubs playing there and you'd be on the underground and it'd be absolute nuts. What You know, with the stuff that was going on down there. Every time your train pulled into a station... It could be like fucking 200 Millwall there, 100 Tottenham going somewhere else across London. You might go across to King's Cross and there'd be 500 fucking leads just, just coming off the train and it'd just be fucking mental, mate. And the only thing I can't understand and I can't get me at how more and more people weren't fucking badly, badly hurt and killed. It's just madness. How many feet? So you're in possibly one in more than one feet and some, some days? Oh, some days London. you'd be... Some, some days... You know, it's that, you know, you'd you'd get on the train, you'd get off a crew and someone would be changing a crew. You'd, you'd have a fucking a set to at crew station. you get to Euston, you'd have a set to there with someone else who's coming up north. You'd go across London on the tubes and there'd be a load of my there on somewhere. You'd get to Arsenal, there'd be fucking murder there. You'd come back to Euston, fucking someone, Millwall were coming back from Luton and, and you'd get back to crew at night and so you'd fucking five or six fucking... Mass breaks of disorder in a in, in a fucking day, you know, and it, it was, that's how it was. It was just part of yeah. it, part of your life. It bonkers. How was it organised back then? Because I know friends Fuck. now are kind of still kind of well, active back in the day, and they used to be friends from different firms. Top boys used to be friends and used to organise that, and then just got on their separate ways. How was it organised well, then? I mean, I, I think it was more sporadic in the seventies and eighties. Seventies totally. That's just off the cuff stuff, wasn't it? But in the eighties, no one had phones or nothing, did they? But you'd you'd have a look at the fixture list, and stuff like that, and think, fucking hell, you know that that's could go there. We could we could be here or there, and 
it was just, it was cat and mouse, really. And then, obviously, a lot of bad stuff happened in the 80s, and then the police became a lot more aware of it, didn't they? They started getting infiltrating people and the gangs, and they started getting a bit cleverer, and then it got a little bit more difficult, but that drove it underground. So in the 90s, phones come out more, and it was getting a little bit more organised, and... And in fairness, that got a bit nastier then because um, it was offside and people were getting can properly hurt and that, you know. And, and the other thing, it's a myth, you're on about myths. What I don't like about it now, people say, you know, it's bullshit. Fucking hell, when you were when we were doing it, there was no one innocent hurt. That's fucking nonsense. How can you pull in at crew station and a fucking big set two goes off? There might be some fuckers going to Alton Towers or something, might not they? We were caught up in it or... West Ham go on the North Bank at Arsenal and, and charge down the fucking women and kids at the front. It's bullshit that only it was only them because it, it involved everybody, didn't it? And that's what it drove away from football. It, it, you know, it, it finished it for a lot of people and they never returned until post-Hillsborough, really, when the grounds became all seated and it was a lot safer to go, you know. Uh, through the decades, you've been active 30, 40 years in, the, in that stuff, but who was the top firms in the 80s? In the 80s, I think... You'd have to give respect to everybody who was at it, really. You know, you could, you could. Man, we, I remember we went on a it's well documented. We went to Chelsea on a Friday night. Chelsea was supposed to be one of the top firms, and took the piss a bit. And a few weeks later, went to QPR and we got spanked. On a day, anybody could turn up anywhere and 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 come, you know, come and miss. Numbers United had were massive. West Ham organised, but you know, I think anybody who was at it at the time should be given the respect from the other firms, I don't mean the general public, you know, they, they'll be looked upon as, as a disgrace, but the ones who um, who were active at the time, I think everybody should have respect for everybody. Yeah. I know it gets a lot of stack people saying, oh, grown men shouldn't fight. What do you think for, about that? I agree with them now, but at the time, I can tell it was, it was in through one ear, out through the other, because it's, it's it was a culture that, you know, you're involved in, and I mean, I lost fucking hell, jobs, Obviously, fines, a little bit of jail, and oh, can I, it can ruin lives, can't it? Mm. But you still went back for more, you know. I got banned in '89, for two years. The bands weren't as strict as they were then. I still went a little bit, but the minute the band was up, you were back at it, you know. Yeah. Can I? Why? And I don't know. It's just it is like it's it's a daft one, mate. I can't. Just people thrive on it because I've interviewed a few football casuals and yeah. I've got to be honest that I know a lot of people give each other stick that, but everybody's been proper diamonds like the big guy, big pal Dante Hawkins. He's Tottenham. I had Bill Gardner, West Ham. I've had Baz Barrington. I've, I've never, I've never met. Um, I've never met um, Dante. I mean, he's more of the younger generation. I've been in Bill's company. Mm -hmm. Absolute gent, you know, a legend of a man. Yeah, and, he is. And, you know, you, you you could take him for for dinner with with your with your missus and kids, and and he think he's just a lovely old grandfellow yeah. who you've met from the bowling club or something. Yeah, I'm one of the most feared yeah. men in London at the football, Class, and people man, would look yeah. and go, "Who hey, am you? I fucking laugh at you." Mm -hmm. Oh no, he's one eyed Baz. You know, people like that. But I just think you've got to put it into perspective. You know, I mean, we we started doing the. The little tours. I know you've had Carlton on Carlton's Carlton, Leach as well. Carlton, Carlton legend of a fella yeah, for many other yeah, reasons. And he's just, just a released a new book, so I'll give that a plug, man. You know, yeah, Carlton's yeah. Carlton's a great fella, but we 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 started <clears> doing the the functions like a little road show with fucking Hooligan Road Show. Like, mm -hmm. Fucking hell. Cass, you know, let, let's get let's not let's not leave Cass out of it. Cass has earned a lot of the casual lads an awful lot of money by keeping the culture going. But I think at his own admission, he probably takes it a bit too serious. You know, we he started this fucking casual road show and we were going, I remember one night, he, do you want to come on this? Fucking 500 quid, top bollocks in Nottingham. Yeah, I'll go like. Gets there. It was me, Cass, Carlton and Boaty. Great lad. Gary Clark from Forest. Fucking diamond of a man. Absolute top, top draw. And... um. We're all getting set to chat. Ah, fucking load of bollocks, what we're ever going to do. And we're in the green room and I remember me and Boatsy and a couple of his pals come out like fucking Tony Montana. Fucking like this, fucking yeah, you know. And Cass said, fucking hell, lads, be more professional. And I was like, you fucking professional? Load of fat, baldy dickheads talking about <laughs> fucking leg in Luxembourg in the 80s. What's there to be fucking professional about? And then he fucked us off. I wasn't invited on another one again. Because mm -hmm. he's not being professional enough talking a load of shite. 
can't take it too serious, mate. It was something we did as youngsters and, and maybe a little bit further on into our lives. But luckily enough, most of us have turned our lives around and we're still here to tell the tale. And I think, you know, with the judge by the success of the books and that it is a tale to tell because a lot of people are interested, aren't they? Whether it's yeah. sociology, criminology, fucking uleology, ule <laughs> if that's such a word, I don't know. But it, it's of interest to an awful lot of people. And I don't know, you know, if... if People can make money out of it, particularly at the level like Sarkas and people have best of luck to them. I won't, I won't have anything bad said against them there, apart from the fact, let's keep it fucking real, you know, let's not be true. You know, it, wasn't as, it wasn't as fucking professional as what people are making out we are, you know. Uh, what's the best crap you've been in? Best big fight? Fucking hell. I think that Chelsea on a Friday night would have took some beating, you know, because a few years before Everton had come a cropper down there and it was always one of them. I mean, the lad at Trans Alpino, jockey, he made T-shirts and there was a thing painted on Lime Street on the wall, ordinary to Chelsea. So instead of getting the special train, everyone was supposed to get a service train, the ordinary, and, and it was a famous quote, and we went down there. And, fucking hell, it was, you know, you, you repay something like that. It's like when you may be being beaten 5-0 at home by someone and then you go away and win 6-0. And it was just... Just one of them nights, everything comes together. And we won, which was a bonus. Like. Mm -hmm. But we've had, you know, we've had some good days out, some bad days out, mate. If you've said, if if, if you come in and any football programme, any football ad and say you've never took a backward step or, you, or you've took a bit of a clack or you've come off second best, you're talking bollocks, to be honest, mate, because we all have. What's that like, getting second prize from a, a tear-up? It's fucking ruined. How does that hurt your prize? Ruins your fucking day, mate. We... Um, Far too, not, you know, it wasn't the 70s and the 90s. We had a thing going with Middlesbrough, and Middlesbrough were, I think, pound for pound, Middlesbrough have, have been for years one of the best firms out there because the big lumps, it's a fucking rough old shit hole, isn't it? And they were fucking, they just, that's all they got to do was go to the football. And we had a thing with them at Everton. You know, usually your, your, lo your local rivalries are United City, fucking Liverpool to a certain extent. And we had this thing with butter like a fucking ding dong for years. And um, fucking hell, we, they come here one day and we were in the pub, thought they'd long gone. And then one of the lads had a call, said, fucking hell. They're walking down, they're walking to Lime Street. And when we fucking came on side and we were in this couple of pubs and we emptied on them, mate. And we, you know, they, they, they had to go, but we fucking battered them like. One of their main fellas, I'll tell you a funny story about a minute, that fella Paul Debrick. The brick, fucking monster of a man, big steroid head. And um, he was on the phone after, fucking you look. And we were playing him on Boxing Day. Like, fucking come here, Boxing Day. And I was going, we'll be there, don't worry, don't worry, mate, we'll be there. And I, I liked the fella, I got on well with him. I fucking hell. We went there on the Boxing Day on a coach, thinking we're all right. You know, we had this fucking, this little firm, Snorty Forty, they were called. <laughs> Because Stoke with a naughty 40. And one day the lad seen us and he said, that's a fucking snorty 40. Then I'm like, you make your own mind up on that. And um, we went to Borough. I remember we parked up by this pub. And one of the doormen come out. He said, uh, Nichols, he said, is this it? I said, yeah, but all right, good fucking 50. Like. He said, get back on the bus and fuck off, you know. She's going to get killed here. Everybody's out. And I was like, yeah, it'll be all right, don't worry. Fucking hell, five minutes later, we wish we'd have got back on the bus, you know. Fucking hell, mate, they come from everywhere. We got chased back to the bus and look, the police fucking saved us. Like, and old Paul was on the fuck. He come up to after by the bus going, nah, you fucking bastards and all this. But funny story about him, when all this um, fucking celebrity stuff started coming, they want you on programmes and all that, don't they? And um, he phoned me up one day, Nichols, fucking, what's up? Oh, fucking hell, what's this loony want now? He said, we're going on the Jeremy Kyle show. I said, you fucking, I'm not going on that, mate. You fucking fruitcake, not happening. He said, no, we are, we're on it. I said, fucking, mate. And then you, how much? He said, 500 quid each. Three of us, 1,500 quid. I said, well, I said, no, I'm not doing it, mate. I've got one fucking Danny Dyer or fucking whatever. I'm not going on the Jeremy Kyle show. So next minute, this fella phones me up. He said, all right, he said, you don't want to come on? I said, no. He said, well, how about if you were the one in the audience? who's saying that you're reformed and rehabilitated and all this. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do with that. I'm not coming on sitting next to him and he's fucking bollocking you and that. 
he said, and then Paul and this other fella from fucking Darlington is going to be in the seat. I said, yeah, I'll do that, Mike. So next minute he's on the phone. You're on, you're on. I said, yeah. He goes, right, your job is when I smash fucking Kyle in the face, you block the bouncers. <laughs> I'm like, what? And he was going to do it live on the telly. The minute Kyle, Jeremy Kyle said something, he's going to fucking welly him. And I'm like, you fucking, and I thought, he's not fucking joking here. Because he's nuts, this lad, like. Anyway, luckily enough, he told that many people what he's going to do. They cancelled the fucking show a few days before. Like, and I was like, thank fuck for that, you know, because that would have been horrendous. Like, yeah, they've got a five. Oh, he'd have got fucking, but he didn't give a fuck. Yeah. And sadly, I, I, I work abroad a lot. Like, I used to fuck off abroad. And I'll never forget, mate, it was a sad day. I was in Copenhagen in the Hilton, fucking about. And uh, sitting in the bar and the phone went, that lad from Darlington, Wheeler, Andy Wheeler, great lad. And he went, um, all right, mate, have you heard about Debrick? And I'm like, fucking hell, what's he done now? And he said, they found him dead this morning. Far too young, you know, but abuse for some sort. I don't know what he's, I don't know what killed him in the end, his heart packed him. But he was, he was again, a great lad. And it's just far too many have, have gone that way, whether it be through drink, drugs, steroids, yeah, you know, steroids are fucking evil, evil, evil thing, mate. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was that was that was sad, but that was that tip of typical of him. And then, you know, like you say, some of the other stuff we went on, we got roped in on the fucking Danny Dyer show. What was that was. like? I had a bad experience on it, to be honest, because it didn't do my own work. The, the first big one we went on was a fella from France. I think his name was Christophe Weber or something, and he was a top documentary maker of the wars and everything. And he, came, he was the first one to do it. And he came over and he sold us this show set called Fucking Hooligans, that's what it was called. All subtitled in France, Germany, whatever. And he, I think he got in touch with me through the publisher and, and I said, I'm not interested, fucking hell. And he says, it's a couple of grand. Said, fucking hell, where do I sign? You know, talking a load of shit about where you've been. And, and anyway, um, this fella come over from France with a TV crew. And I was involved, just involved in non-league football at the time and he... He wanted to follow me to the ground and watch me do a team talk or a training session. And it was a piece of piss and it was all right. Everybody got on. I think he did about four or five different clubs. And it came out and it was highly acclaimed, this, this documentary. And I think that's where the real football factory, if you like. Danny Dyer was in the football factory, wasn't it? And then he started making these documentaries, the real football factory. And... Um, they paid us a bit of money. They paid some people more than others. I probably one of the best paid for them. I'd have got a grand, I don't know. But they they were getting a group of people, Sky at the time, to go around all the these fucking daft shows, fucking hell, Britain's roughest fucking seaside resorts, Britain's roughest pubs, Britain's yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. worst kebab shops and fucking all this. And it was the same group of people, on it? And there's a great lad, a really good friend of mine, sadly passed away a few years ago, Colin Blaney. He wrote the Grafters books, proper old Man United old school. And he was on them, and he brought one of Man U's old lads, Eddie Beef, um, who, who in his day was a proper handful, who very sadly passed away a couple of months ago, Eddie. And um, we, were, we were doing all these different things. And then it wasn't long after there was a big set to at Goodison, Everton United, the Battle of Everton Valley, they called it. I was banned at the time, I wasn't even there, but they wanted us to talk about it. And then they got Blaney and Eddie to meet us in the pub and we had this bit of a chat. And we got stitched, to be honest, because we had, I had to go and meet Danny for a walk around the ground to talk bollocks to him. And these two fucking pairs stayed in on the ale. And the likes of Eddie and Blaney, if there was a free bar there, mate, they'd fucking smash it to smithereens, never mind. And I've come back in the pub and they were fucking Lego, you know, and... And it was one of them, you go, just go and get changed, put a different top on so it looks different from the walk around with Danny and that. And I could hear Eddie fucking hell. He used to sing that, what's it, the fucking song? Let it be. And he put his own Eddie B. Fed yeah, fuck, it's going to be hard work. Like, Come down. And then they took Blaney then for the talk with Dyer. And me and Eddie were interviewed. And do you know what, James? We must have had half an hour of ripping each other to bits and top banter. And he was fucking, he winding me up and he, he said something and I bit and said, you're chatting fucking shit now, shut the fuck up and that. And then when it come out, that's what they showed. They cut all the laughs out and that. And to this day, I regret that because it made Eddie look fucking stupid and he was far from fucking stupid. 
I wish we could have seen that before it went out, but they said, you're not fucking doing that. Like. Mm -hmm. But that's what happens with these things. You know, yeah, I, I, did, you I, I did a fucking panorama once, mate. I was in Spain on, on, a, on, a, on holiday with some lads. And this fella said, do you want to go on panorama next week before the World Cup? Mm -hmm. Fucking panorama, the fuck going off? He said, do you want your honours, this fucking expert, fucking panorama? I was like, fuck, you know. Go on if you want, yeah, what's the money? Like the BBC don't want to pay, I'll fucking go in anyway. If I'll get you 500 quid. Landed, fucking hell, and we were fucking hammering it. And they asked us loads of questions about your parents in the war and all this. And I remember just saying, he said, I said, from an early age, all my grandfather described the Germans as was German bastards because... They fucking bombed his streets. They did, you know, and ended up they hated one. My granddad had been dead fucking 20 years. So, you know, he he would have been he was in the first world war. But and I've worked in Germany, I got in great with them. And then all in this panorama program, they'd switch to the thing, oh what you know, what have you got to say to the and had me going German bastards and that like and thinking, when are you ever gonna fucking learn? You know, then you <laughs> then you do it again, you fucking go on another mm -hmm. one and so we're having a good look at this one before it comes out, mate. <laughs> Fucking hell. You know what I'm saying? And, that, and that's what it is. We, we, were, we were stitched for it, but it was... I mean, we weren't... A, we weren't. We didn't have to do it, mate, but with the publishing companies, like, you're obliged to do it for selling the books and stuff like it's that. business. It's business, mate, but I think some of it... Fucking hell. In the end, I just stopped going on them. You know, we could have gone on fucking all sorts of different ones, yeah. and I knocked them in the end, then, mate. You know, they used to say after... Uh, fucking 10 years after the book came out, we'll give you book a mention. I said, fucking hell, it's been in, it was in the bestsellers for five years. It doesn't need any more fucking mentions. Yeah. What was it like? Who, what's the difference from firms here and the firms abroad? Because the ultras and that abroad look like fucking psychopaths. Yeah, but I think... Is that a big difference or is it kind of the same? You know, I'm a firm believer, mate, if... The 30 years too late, aren't they, mate? You know, when there's, in the 70s, England and English clubs abroad were fucking... The, the top dogs and there was no no real opposition that these now are trying to you know emulate something which they missed the boat on haven't they so you've got the Russians running around fucking fields with gloves on and cooking gum shields and yeah, knocking the fuck out of each yeah, other yeah. the Poles and the Eastern Europeans and it's more of a sport than a fucking casual culture isn't it mm -hmm. best to look to them if they want to do that but Keep it, keep it to themselves, you know. They, they missed the boat, mate. It doesn't fucking interest me, all that bollocks. Did you ever come up against a good firm abroad? Um, fucking hell, Anderlecht. We went to Anderlecht once and we got off at the wrong station. Well, we got off at the right station because we were told not to get off there. And we ended up going out like fucking hell. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. I mean, we, all right, we, we, we were close knit. We did all right. Fire Nord, we went in the late 70s. Rough fucking place. Like, you're know, going to these places, are rough, aren't they? Fucking Rotterdam, you know. People say, oh, they're foreign film. It's going to be a rough as fuck area. It's like Liverpool, Rotterdam, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you look at the Italians now and I think you see them in, in Leicester the other week taking the belts off and fucking trying to take people's eyes out with belts and all that. Fuck off. You know, give it up now, mate. Mm -hmm. Put your fucking belts on. Fuck off home, you know. It's not... Yeah. It doesn't do it for me, that. You know, it's not really what, it, what it's all about. But, you know, if they're still at it, they're still at it, mate, aren't they? See, when you're proper active, though, and obviously you're a mad Everton fan. Does it does it score even matter? Or are you just going there to fight? No, after mate, a while? I, I love the football, mate. And you know, I, I see some people do that and say, I don't give a fuck about the results, mate. I wanted Everton to win every game and I loved it. The best years of my life, 84, 85, 87, you know, when Everton had a great side, Howard Kendall was the manager, and it was just the best days of our lives. That and we started going abroad a bit. And obviously, Heisel happened, and, and Heisel, I went to Heisel. At the time, a lot of Everton and Liverpool lads would go away to get a grafting, and I, I was at Heisel, and it was, it was a terrible, terrible night. That. And it changed, I think, football. You know, everyone got banned from Europe, and it was fucking a sad, sad night for football. That. What was it like between Everton and Liverpool? Was there many scraps? In them days, it wasn't so bad because a lot of the older lads all knew each other, and it'd be more drunken, pissed up fights at the end, but. After after Heisel with the banning orders and like a lot of people resented them because kind of you know when you, you cost you know people say it cost us a European Cup but I don't know if we'd have ever won the European Cup but you got a better chance of winning it by the end the fucking thing haven't you the government banned everybody from from playing European football didn't they so it got a bit more nastier between the two lots of lads and then the younger lots have come through and 
And I'd say now it's a derby now, and like the others have gone. You know, when the old, when we used to go, you'd be sitting next to someone Liverpool fan, and there might be the odd punch thrown. And there'd be fucking three thousand Everton in the cop when they played at Goodison, a couple of thousand Liverpool in the Gladys Street. Now it's fucking segregated. You know, you couldn't do it. You might have the odd mate of someone who's there, but it's not. It's probably one of the more hostile derbies now between the fans because of the resentment between each other. You know. Did you ever go over and fight for England? Yeah, we went, games. Lot, we went a lot of England games. How does that games. work then? That really all the firms who fight against each other, they all unite and the winners, do you still no, fight mate, each other? No, it was bad. In the 70s, mate, West Ham were fucking nasty. <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, we used to go Everton, Liverpool lads, and the Manx, we got on well with the Manx because we were all grafting and doing the T-shirts and stuff like that. And we got on all right with them. But them fucking Cockneys, mate, they were horrible, you know. They, they'd be they'd just, you know, they'd be... You'd have to go on different boats and fucking plug. There was no fly. He didn't fly around in them days. He was on the boats and that. And it was fucking it was a dodgy, dodgy place to go, mate, watching England. Um, and it was scary at times. Like, I remember going to, I was working in Sweden in 86 and England played Sweden. And they're fucking trouble between each other. Leeds, Chelsea were having a thing at the time. Um, on the odd games, like I think in the Euros in 80, was it 80, 88 in Germany? Yeah, just before Italia 90 was when they started getting together a bit then because the Germans had a massive mob, the, the Dutch had a massive mob. So it was like more fucking, you have to stick together here. And a lot of the lads kind of did get together and say, look, obviously there'd still be the odd Birmingham and Villa that'd have a bit of a punch up in the pub, Wolves and West Brom, Tottenham and fucking Chelsea would never get on. But in the main, they stuck together a bit more then, and that mm -hmm. kind of brought it together. And I was banned again when they, when they started having a few set twos with Poland and that. But by then, I think everyone had kind of, you know, stuck together, and they, they mm -hmm. that's what they, that's what they did, and that's what they, they were better at doing really. Because if you have got all them in house arguments going on, you're not going to be, you're not going to be safe here. Yeah. What was it like? What was the one? Was it? Remember the, the, the Leeds fans get murdered? Was that in Turkey? Yeah, in Turkey. Um, see, when you see stuff like that, does that make you question it and think, it's, that just happened to me, or do you get angry about it? I think at that time then, you know, it can happen to you. And you, know, you think, fucking hell, you know, that's, that's just wrong, isn't it, mate? You know? yeah, like I say, Heisel was bad, you know, and a lot of people, I argue with a lot of people who, who say, oh, that fucking wouldn't have happened, we were great and all that. Heisel was the, the one that brought it to the head, wasn't it? And when I was over there, it was a shit all over ground, shit segregation. And I think a lot of England firms who would have been there, like the, the, the big club firms, would have had the same problem that, that Liverpool had that time. The only problem was, I think, with, with what pissed everybody off, that the bit of a smoke screen was put up at the time and then the government got involved and banned everyone. I think if they'd have probably said, look, yeah, sorry, ban us for a year or so, it might have saved everybody from being banned. You go on about Everton, United missed out on great chances. Little clubs like Coventry, Southampton, <clears throat> fucking Wimbledon won the cup never had a chance to compete in Europe because the government were eventually going to be sick to fucking death of, of what was going on and, and they blanket banned everyone and then FIFA or wherever it was, UEFA threw a bit more on, didn't they? And then fucked it up for everybody, really. Yeah. What was it late in the 80s, early 90s when it started hitting with not just fines then, it became five years, six years prison sentences? Well, you know, we were, we were I got lucky once. We was I was working abroad and I came home for Christmas and we went to Arsenal. And I'd been away a couple of years and the rave scene had took off big time. And I missed out on all that, which I'm thankful for because I reckon I'd have gone bang into that because of the money you could earn and that. I was working abroad and I remember coming home to Arsenal, flying over to, to London and then meeting the lads at Euston, the train come in and about fucking 60 got off. And I was like, I missed the fucking, where is everyone? And this lad was saying to me, this is it now, lad. This is what, this is what we've got. Fucking, you know, we've gone from like three or four hundred in them two years to fucking 60 because of what was going on and people had all started going to raves and it's a little hardcore thing. And we come out of Arsenal, Arsenal Station, fucking right by this pub, fucking stupidest thing ever. A couple of lads by the pub and these cockneys were going, fucking keep going. And we were just straight into them, fucking bang, 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 and off we go. And the fucking police station was next to this pub where the, all the fucking police were getting their match day this is what you have to do. And I remember this copper saying to us, fucking hell, we opened the window and there you were. And they nicked us all. 30, 31, 32 of us got nicked. 
but about half a dozen got fucking pulled in by mistake. They come off the next tube and they shit themselves. Where, where do we go? Go with them lot. And they got nicked. And we went to um, Ivory Magistrates Court before Christmas. And they said, right, got a trial in January, February. And we went there and we were like fucking laughing, you know, yeah, you know, breach of the fucking whatever it was. It might have been a fucking breach of the peace, whatever. Threatening behaviour. All of us got done for threatening behaviour on block. And the next minute, the fucking magistrate come in, guilty. And all these fucking police come in. And our, our fucking solicitor was like, you know, and he was going, the fella going, yeah, I, thought, I don't know, fucking sent us all to jail for two months or something, I don't know. And I was like, you fucking what? Fuck all. Boom, off you go. But the funny thing was, James, at the time, the fucking prison officers were on strike. So there was, there was nowhere to take you. So we got put on these fucking minibuses and they were taking us to all prison cells all over the, police cells all over the country. Remember me, a lad, Mick Blaney and Jock got fucking dropped off at fucking El Melton Mowbray, the fucking pie place, fucking <laughs> by Leicester. And we were in this fucking police station and it, this must be a first, mate, honestly. The, the, the traffic police were looking after us and there was an exercise yard at the back. It's fucking middle of the, middle of the fucking summer. Just as my mind, maybe the start of spring, fucking remember it boiling hot. We were sitting in this prison yard and this Mr. Big from Leicester got brought in, big drug dealer. And then he says, right, lads, he said, you know, we don't want any fucking hassle here. Don't fuck anything. We said, fucking hell, mate, we've just got, I don't know, three or four weeks to do in here. Fuck off. We're all right. And um, there's a black fella in the cell, but there's about six of us there. And this fucking drug dealer at night said, right, lads, I've got some fucking orange juice here. I brought some orange in. His bird bringing this orange in. Fucking full of vodka and orange. It's fucking drinking and shit. And outside, fucking drinking. It's supposed to be in fucking prison. And then the next minute, this fucking copper comes in. He goes, lads, do you want us to go and get you any pizzas and shit? And it was like, fucking, it was like a little Aldi camp. And then the soft swats appealed on the sentence. And after we'd been there about a week, and this fella brought us in, he said, listen, I've got some good news. You could be going home tomorrow. We were going, fuck off. We'll stay here for another week. We'll do the sentence. And he was going, you fucking... I said, fuck off. We'll stay. The three of us both said, no, we don't want to go. But because we were all sent at the same time and all as one, we had to get released. And we were fucking gutted that we'd been released. Because what you had to remember then was you're going back to court... Crown court, sentence could have been a lot worse and you're going to end up in fucking jail. And that's what happened. We went back, two weeks in London, Crown Court, Southern Crown Court it was. And this fucking judge was having none of it, horrible bastard. And he sent us, Gerard Butler, never forget him, fucking sends us all to jail. And by then all this strike was over, straight to Brixton. Now trust me, mate, you don't want fucking 30 Everton on a wing in Brixton. It was fucking on top to fuck, mate, proper on top. It was fucking evil. So they had to put us on a segregation fucking unit. I'll never forget, mate, on the Sunday, one of the scariest I've been in my life, this lad said to us, listen, if you want to, when you get half an hour out of the cell a day, go for your meals, take your meals back to your cell, all for our own protection. And then he said to us, on a Sunday, put your name down for church. He said, it's a fucking hour walk through the church and then everybody joins you. From, they can't stop no one going to church. Half an hour in church, hour back, Sunday dinner. Kills a fucking morning. Like, fucking hell, we do that, mate. Fucking hell, mate. I've never seen anything like it. It was the fucking scariest day of my life, mate. They had to let all the IRA there. There was loads of IRA in, at the time in Brixton. It was just not long after when an helicopter tried to land and fucking break people out. It was all that time. And these IRA, fucking all sorts of fucking paedophiles and that in the church. It was going off over the fucking... Pews, the aisles, fucking the vicar, whatever his name, fucking pack it in, come on, lads, they're praising. You'd fucking hear that, so, ah, someone else, like, fucking hell. And i never forget the week after the fellow at church, everyone went, fuck off, we're not going back there again. Mm -hmm. It was fucking scary, mate, and that was a bad, bad, evil place. Then we did the rest of the sentence, and we come out, and for our own safety then, they didn't even let us go and fuck off. They put a coach on to get us out of there, because such was the bad feeling we were all down, and it was mobs outside. Fucking horrible, mate. They, it was fucking on top to fuck, mate. What do you do when you come out? Do you ever think, right, okay, I'm going to change my life, or do you think just want to go for the next battle? Well, we was banned then. We were on a football. We, we, we were on a ban. No, we were on a banning order then, mate. 
How long? 18 month banning order, I think it was. Did you ever skip in when you had yeah, the ban? Yeah, because no one gave a fuck in them days. Yeah, no cameras, So, no so we were, we were, that season, Everton played, it was the season of Hillsborough. Bad, bad fucking, you know, 89. We come out of jail and I fucking go. And I never forget, we went to Villa Park the same day of Hillsborough. And, and, it, and that's a sad part of it, mate. That was a toss of a coin where you're playing it. Everton played Norwich at Villa Park. Liverpool played Forest at Hillsborough. That could have been us at Hillsborough. You know, fucking the saddest thing that's ever happened in football, isn't it? You know, all them fucking kids, fucking yeah, people. Sad, man. 97, now it was 96, you know, and, and it, it just, you know, I've seen the programmes on it. The two daughters died and, you know, there was there was a lad from over my ass, John 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 O'Brien, McBrien or something died. You know, sixteen, seventeen. It's fucking horrible, mate. And that could have been us if we'd have we'd have had the toss of that kind and we'd have played Norwich that day at Hills. But that could have been us, and you got to remember that. But we were banned at the time, so we still went. And then we beat Norwich one nil, and we still didn't know the enormity of what had happened that day. And we were all on the piss and that. And I remember going home with them on them big fucking box furniture vans. We all in them days. And we pulled into this fucking pub, fucking Stafford or something. And we walked in, fucking Wembley and that. And then people were looking at us, you fucking disgusting bastards. And I was like, what? And it was on then. And then you realise the enormity of it, you know, like fucking 15 dead, 20 dead. And remember we had the radio on the way home and the lad was going, fucking hell, it's 40. And then, and that finished it, didn't it, for many footballers as, 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 it, as it happened. Um, and then we went to the cup final that year. We played Liverpool in the cup final. Liverpool won the rearranged game. And we still went. We were banned. And a few got nicked. And then it just started getting a bit smarter. The police were on you and that. And um, so I, I remember we, we played Millwall away. And I let like, oh, fucking not going there. It was on top. And a few were getting nicked. And I think after that, that changed it, mate. They were on to everybody. And they come with the undercover fellas. The liaison officers were following you around and that, and it was, it, it was, you know, it was on top to fuck then, like, and, you, and they seen like lads were getting, lads were getting five or six years in jail when if they'd have done it in a pub fight, they'd have got fucking community service. Yeah, slap the rest. What was my wall like? They've always got the reputation of being a top fun. I've been there a couple of times, mate, and it was nothing, nothing of, of note really. I don't think they've, they've, um, had the same thing in that new ground they were, but obviously there's, there's stuff going on now down there, isn't there? So it's 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 a, it's a tough subject to talk about, that, mate. Who's the top firms you came up against? Um, fucking hell, like you say, you know, on the day, mate, and you know, I, I don't think you can, you know, you can you can disrespect any of them, mate. You know, the likes of fucking the London lot. You know, I've been a testimonials at Everton when Celtic and Rangers come down. It's been fucking bedlam, mm -hmm. mate. Absolute fucking bedlam. Aberdeen, we went up, we went up, fucking hell, that was a nightmare. We went up to Aberdeen, um, pre-season friendly, and we went up there. And we get there on the Saturday morning, and there was a bit of bit of fucking my, they're not great deal. And then we come out of the ground and it was going off again. And they were quite a rough place, Aberdeen, like fucking middle of nowhere. Yeah, big that big fucking. And I'll never forget, mate. We were in this Islanders. fucking we were in this hotel. Got ready now to go out for the night. I remember this fella behind the bar saying, hey, lads, fucking be careful tonight, he said. It's not like fucking England, this, mate. He said, if you get fucking nicked here tonight, he said, you don't get your fucking charge sheet and you come back in a fortnight. You're here till fucking Monday. Yeah, weekend, though. And he said, and the bad news is, Monday's a bank holiday. You're here till fucking Tuesday. <laughs> and we were like, fuck off. Anyway, as I was going to court on Tuesday, I thought he was telling the fucking truth. We were there all week in that fucking castle place and it was fucking horrible. Yeah. And that went on for about a year. That fucking truck, the was fucking nightmare, mate. We had to travel up every once a month to give out bail. And it went on and on because they were pulling more and more people in. And there was about 20 of us in the end, Everton Aberdeen. And we ended up with Mad James. We ended up fucking great mates of them. And it was, it was, it fucking goes to show how the football lads are just, in the end, we were going to fucking pub with them. Fella Willie Miller used to be captain of Aberdeen. He had a pub outside the, the fucking courts. I and mean, he used to be the manager, yeah. We used to go there and have a, have a pint with him before we went into court and that. And we were all going, it was fucking, they're going to get two years here. It went on that long. And the day we went up to trial for, for sentencing, um, this fucking judge said, I'm not having these probation reports. Fuck off and come back, saying why I should give you. 12 months, not two years, because our probation officer said, fucking hell, you're good lads, you're all right, blah, blah, blah. 
Oh, fucking hell, that's a nightmare. Went back the following week for sentencing. This fella had fucking food poisoning. They put some fucking judge in charge, didn't have a clue, and he gave us a fucking fine. So that was us in the Aberdeen lads. We were on the fucking lash, long into the night. Great, great lads, and the luckiest escape ever that, mate, because mm -hmm. a long weekend there was bad enough in that Aberdeen. I couldn't have done two years up there, mate. <laughs> I would have done me fucking living. <laughs> Seen you quite against guys like uh, Big Baz who was with the Zulus and yeah. Birmingham, like kickboxing world champion. How see if you're, you're in a scrap, do you know right he can fucking scrap? You'd, see, you'd, still a free you'd, for all? See, you'd see a few mates at the front. I'm, I'm, I'm not a fucking hard fella, we just think we're a bit fucking mad and a bit daft. And everyone's got these fucking big fellas, haven't they? Mm -hmm. So leave them fucking to it, really. You have a little <laughs> look around, you see a big fella with one black eye coming in and his fucking yeah. foot's this eye, you think, fuck him, I'll go around, <laughs> there, it? you know. But they're good lads, weren't they? Baz, people like that. You know, the fucking size of Cass, as if you see Cass. Oh, fuck that, mate. Bill, you know, Ben Bill was yeah, younger. Yeah. The fucking Massive. lump, mate. Yeah. What's the line going to be like? Fucking, mm -hmm. is anyone my size around there type of thing? Uh -huh. But then it's fucking big free for all, mate. You, you're lucky or you're unlucky. You know, I've been I've been putting my ass by fucking five foot two fucking fellas, but they can hit hard. So, you know, it's just it's one of them, mate, yeah. isn't it? Just, what was it like when you got your life ban from Everton? I was gutted, to be honest, James, because... I'd done no fucking wrong at the time. Obviously, I got offered the book deal, mate, and I did the book, and it came out a lot worse than what I could have done, if you like, because it was a life story, and I'd said, they took all the stuff out, didn't they, and it was a pure football hooligan book, which wasn't necessarily me. You know, I had, I had lots of other things going on in my life that I wrote about. Anyway, so that's, that was hard luck, mate. It goes with the territory you write in the book, doesn't it? And a few weeks before, the publisher said, listen, there's a fella from the Liverpool Echo coming to see you and he wants to do this big story. And I was like, yeah, that's all right. And he's, he said, he's already warned me. It's not going to be fucking nice reading. I was like, you know, that's all right. We'll do it, you know. So when I met this fella, lovely fella, I can't remember his name anyway. It was just before the season started. The book was ready to go, but they weren't bringing it out till October. These publishing companies have a date of release so they can hit the certain market. So they're all on the shelves for Christmas. So I'll never forget, mate, it was like October, the book was coming out, but it was ready in the in the August and people having sneak previews of it. And um, I'd been on holiday to Cyprus and I remember coming home and I, as a little safety net, I'd started doing bits of charity work for the former Players Foundation in Everton. They're like a nice registered charity. And as Everton in the community, and I'd started doing a bit of work with them because I kind of had to think I need a bit of good publicity here. So I'd registered to do a bit of work for these. Anyway, um, I came home and I'd done a couple of little dinners and thrown them a bit of money. And I come home and this thing said, um, do you want a week on Saturday, you can play at Goodison. And nowadays you can, you can book the pitch at the end of the season and hundreds of people playing it. In them days, it was fucking unheard of. You can play at Goodison before David Unsworth's testimonial, Everton old boys and celebrities against Liverpool old boys and celebrities. I was like, fucking hell, that'll be all right. You know, a little thank you. Thanks very much. And um, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And I was thinking, fucking hell, it won't be top players playing and all that. Anyway, turned up the fucking ground with me bag and all this. And um, goes in the dressing room. It was like fucking Neville Southall was in goal. Joe Parkinson, Mark Ward was playing, Graham Sharp, Derek Mountfield was the manager. And he were there, like, yeah, you know, to try and give the non players half a match each. So he said, What so he said, What's your I said, I'll go full back, mate. I'll be all right. I'll, I'll, I'll go full back. He said, Right, okay, yeah. And we went in the tunnel, and then Liverpool come out. And the first person I saw was fucking John Barnes, like, <laughs> and I'm thinking, Fucking hell, mate. I'm just full of fucking Keo Lager and fucking Mezzies. <laughs> and this fucker's only finished playing about two years ago, and I'm marking him. And I was like, that's when I realised adrenaline was fucking brown, mate. And I said to Derek Manfield, listen, mate, I feel a bit. I'm going to spew up. Nerves. But I just didn't. I wasn't feeling. I just thought I'm going to get onto myself. He said, right, swap with him, Billy. So John Bailey, fucking great fella, John Bailey. Everton, fucking top, top ex-player. Great laugh. He said, John, you go on. And I said, I'll just have to go to... The so the biggest regret I've had, I missed going out to Z Cars before. The, that would have been great, you know. And there was about, I think there's about 20,000 at the end. But this was like an hour and a half before the main game, 20 minutes each way. So there's about 10,000 in there. 
would have been great going out to that. And um, I remember going in the dressing room, pretending to fanny around a bit. And then I come back down. I thought, right, they've fucking started by now. So I've gone down the steps. Fucking John Barnes comes off. He's pulled his fucking hamstring in the warm-up. And they've replaced him with Stan Boardman in a fucking German outfit with fucking wellies on. So I could have had a fucking field day, you know. Mm. Anyway, the game goes on. I went on in the second half. We beat the fuckers 2-1, which was good. And they had, like, Mike Cooper in goal, Rob Jones, Phil Neal, David Fairclough, fucking people like that playing. And um, I remember fucking Rob Jones putting it past me and going to run past it. I cleaned him and put him into the gravel. And the ref was like, and fair dues, that Rob Jones, like, oh, he's only fucking. I remember Derek Mountfield going, fucking back in. You know, everyone was cheering. <laughs> anyway, we come off. We, we won 2-1, we come off. And... um. He goes in the dressing room, get changed, and the fellow's like, right, lads, fucking hurry up here now, because all the first team are arriving. It's a proper match now, Everton against Atletico Bilbao. And Unsworth come in, give us all a little shitty medal. And then there was little envelopes for the players' expenses. And then fair play, he said, look, lads, all the money's going to the former Players Foundation. I don't think anyone wants the envelope. And I won't mention who it was, but he was an absolute twat. He said, fuck off. He said, I'm, I want mine. An ex-top Liverpool professional was the only one to take the envelope. And he fucked off. So they give us these tickets out to go in the stands to watch the proper match. And as I was going up the stairs, this steward said, um, can I have a word a minute, mate? I said, yeah. He goes, you can't go in. So what do you mean I can't go in? He said, you, you, you can't go in. He said, we've had a word. You've, you've got to fuck off. So I've just fucking played on the pitch, you soft twat, you know. And he's like, no, you fucking clear off. You're not allowed in on the list. And that was the start. I thought, oh, fucking hell. And apparently the Echo had sent this thing to the club club had gone we're not fucking having this so a few weeks later we were playing Arsenal and it was the game when Rick Wayne Rooney scored that for his first oh, goal the yeah, wonder yeah, goal yeah. of Seaman beat Arsenal's record mm -hmm. and I was there that day the morning and then this fucking taxi pulled up outside my apartment pressed the buzzer it was alright lads yeah got a fucking letter here for you and it was the big letter and um, we had a board meeting last night and they've taken this in to ban you for life like, fucking hell, that's a bit harsh, isn't it, you know? You know, because as much as I probably deserved a bit of a bollocking or something, I thought, fucking hell, that's fucking way over the top. So anyway, we thought we'll, we'll appeal against it and shit like that. And then a few weeks later, we were going to Holland on a trip somewhere, and I got fucking pulled in at the airport by the police. And they just said, look, we're taking your fucking passport off you. Um, you're in court tomorrow on the basis of some of the excerpts we've taken out of your book, which were in this current time frame, which meant they could take you to court over it. It's like, fucking hell, don't need that. And it was funny as fuck. Have you seen that programme on the telly, like, airport, when they interview people by the fucking dickheads have forgot their passport and that, haven't they? It's all easy jet and that, isn't it? Oh, here's Billy, he's forgot his passport and that. And I walked off and this fella said, oh, we're doing this thing. What was going on then? And I just said, oh, mate, I fucking had my passport talking with the police. I'm trying to change my ticket. And he said, oh, would you be interested to do a little interview with us on what's happened there? We've had not that before. I'm like, fuck off. I'm trying to fucking mind you when that's on. And he said, oh, well, where are you going now? I said, I'm fucking going to try and change my ticket to fucking Amsterdam and I'm going to have a fucking couple of days of smashing everything in sight. Like, when the, when the, when the programme came on, it wasn't on that. Like, he didn't get on it. So I went to court and I got a two, two maybe a three-year ban um, from any football. It's like, fucking hell, it's getting worse, this, is it? And you think then, is it worth all the fucking hassle, you know? But then every now and again, you get a check for 10 fucking grand off your book and you think, yeah, I'll take that. Like, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. I don't get bothered. And then I thought, fucking hell, I'm a bit pissed off here. So I got into, um, got into local football. I'd been... Always done a bit of amateur football playing, not particularly any good, but played probably reasonable levels. But I always preferred the Sunday league because I always watched Everton on Saturday. Now I was banned. I started fucking taking a bit more of interest in the Saturday football. And this Sunday football team I'd, I'd managed for five or six years. Again, I got I was fucking banned from everything. I got banned from playing for fucking a year fighting with some fucking fans on the side of the pitch when I was playing. And um, I took this Sunday football club over and they were bottom of Division 4. We won 4-3, 2-1, retained 1. And my dad was poorly at the time. 
So we disbanded it. But then this club come in, little village club we always been, had a good good team come in to me and said, do you want to come as a number two to this this lad? A good mate of mine, Perry. I said, yeah, I'll have a go at that. So we didn't have to do any badges in them days. It was second tier of Welsh footballers. And I really enjoyed it. Like I really got, I started to prefer the non-league side of football and the professional bit, partly because I couldn't go. And um, fucking hell, we had, we had a great season. But do you know what? We we got Bangor in the Welsh Cup, who were a top team. Bangor are one of the most well-supported teams in Welsh football. And the other lad, the lad who was the manager, was a player manager. He was like fucking, he, he's going to play in that game, so I was going to be in charge. And their manager, mate, was a fucking, you might remember him, Peter Davenport. Played for Forest, Man United. Mm -hmm. And um, we come up against them. And at half time, we fucking hell, it was nil nil. They were giving him dogs abuse, fucking screaming, shouting him going down the tunnel. Fuck off out of our club, you English bastard and all this. You, you shut your fucking hell. And as I walked down, I just said, I'm available if he gets fucked off. And they all had to laugh at that. Anyway, they come out in the second half, they fucking hammered us about six nil. And at the end of the game, that's how poor he was, mate. I went to shake hands and he went, you're still available now, fuck off. Horrible bastard. And that summed up, and he got fucked off a few weeks later. But then from that, I took over another club, Hollywood Town, a, quite a big club in, in Welsh football. And as manager, number one there. And uh, honestly, mate, the minute I took over, all the press wanted to do was talk about me past. There was fucking headlines, thug takes over the town, fucking nightmare, fuck. Oh, every bit of press was bad press. And... You know, went on about football associates and that, mate. I was on a fucking hide into nothing, mate. And by the time I left, I was banned from every aspect of fucking non-league football as well. <laughs> um, oh, the run-ins I had in with them, mate, they were fucking horrible, mate. Yeah. They were absolute twats. We were had one we had one game there, mate. This is how bad the press were, right? But how gullible they are. We were in the Welsh Cup and we drew Aberystwyth, who were a much better side than us. But they drew the round after and the round after was like winners of two shit teams so I thought if we beat them you know we're in the quarters and if we in the semis if we get the right draw the team in the final TNS New Saints will win the league they're already in the fucking Champions League she so got into Europe through this so I put a little press thing out I said someone said oh, what do you think of the draw like they phoned you up the press and I said Fuck, I'm a bit worried, you know. If we beat Abba Rush with, then we're playing one of these two shit teams. And TNS in this, just, just roll-balled one in. And the next minute, it was in the papers. Fucking Scally manager can't go to Europe if Ollie will fucking get in the thing. And they had to drag me back to court to put a fucking dispensation or something in the in the court order because it was stopping you getting a job if you got... And it was fucking never going to happen. Never in a million years we're going to get into Europe. But that's how gullible and that these FA were and an absolute gang of twats like. How did you get into management? How did you get into that? Just through the Sunday League, really. I did that well on the Sunday League. And I mean, like, the first, probably the team who went from... Was that the first team you ever managed? Yeah, just, to just managing fucking... Teams? And, and to, to managing second tier uh -huh. Welsh football, you know. Uh -huh. And then, fucking hell, mate. And, and to, don't get me wrong, mate, there's not a lot to it. It's like the, like the Premier League. Money rules, mate, even at that level. And grassroots football is fucked because of it. Because the best teams in non-league football are probably the ones with the best budgets. So you've got the best players because you can pay them the most money. And then you've just got to go big goalie, big centre-half, centre-mid, striker, you, you square peg, square holes. You, you do all right. The last year I was there, mate, we, we beat four clubs, Airbus, landed no Pristatton, Bala. With me as manager, and within three years, all of them were in the UEFA Cup because they had top budgets. And then this club, bless them, you know, they, they were fucking on the bones of their ass. And then we had a bad season, we were going down. And um, this is where it all went wrong. We were we played this team on the outskirts of Wrexham, Gresford, and there's no love lost between Flinching and Wrexham. And it was virtually impossible for us to stay up. We were fucked, you know, but mathematically we could. And we were winning 2-1 and I was there with my fucking suit on by the dugout and they were all fucking raving on this next dugout and then they got a penalty in the last minute. I was like, fucking hell. But mathematically, we still stayed up. But we were fucked. We were going down. And they scored this penalty and i never forget this twat next to us 
jumping up and down. He was like the fucking fella off the mean machine. Yeah. Remember him? Fucking cunt, send them down. Fucking tonight, send them fucking down. I've just popped off. Fucking hell, mate, the lot's gone. Into the dugout. Fucking match abandoned. Everybody fighting. And I remember their chairman coming up, lovely fella. Fucking great charity work. I do a lot of functions with him. A fella called Phil Jones, and he just says to me, Nico, you've got a fucking screw loose. You're a disgrace. And it hurt me, you know, and a fucking suit covered in mud and shit. I said, fuck off him. And he went, he's got Tourette's, mate. I was like, <laughs> I was like fuck <laughs> off. He said, mate, he's fucking suffered for years. I was like, oh, can I say? He said, fuck off. Just an hour. I was like, oh, Jesus fucking Christ. So the next minute now, this fucking letter landed like a fucking encyclopedia, mate. All his charges and that. But just bringing the game into disrepute. So I fucking got in touch with this lawyer and he went, just plead fucking guilty, £200 fine, that, mate. Because you're not a player, it's not fucking violent conduct and that, just... Mm. Anyway, so pleaded guilty. Mm. Next minute, fucking fine come, 1200 quid. Like, you fucking what? You know, people don't... Professional footballers weren't getting fucking fined that. This is like 10, 12 years ago. Fuck off. So I phoned the woman, I said, what's this for now? 1200 fucking quid. She said, well... £600 fine, £600 cost. So what's the fucking cost for? She said, well, it was that bad in the referee's report. We got them down to explain to us what you what you did. I said, it doesn't fucking work that way, love. I said, if I plead guilty to something, you're fucking guilty. So you go by what that report is. You don't need no one to come and put fucking jam on it. You can fuck off with that. I'm not paying it. She said, I don't know what you mean. I said, look, let me tell you this now. And there was this horrible fella, John Deakin, at Welsh FA fella, he's a twat. I said, if I come in your office now, is Mr. Deacon there? She went, yeah, he is. I said, if I come down there now with a samurai sword, chopped his fucking head off, right? You see it. I plead guilty in court. You don't have to go to court. That's how it is. If I plead not guilty, you go to court. That's where all the expenses come from. I said, I pleaded fucking guilty. So you bringing the referee and the two linesmen to say how fucking bad it was is absolute bollocks. I'm not paying it. Anyway. She put the phone down about 10 minutes later. This fella phoned me from the Welsh He said, fucking hell, mate, you're in the shit. Do you want to phone the police on you? I said, why? He said, you're threatening to chop this fella's fucking head off. I said, fuck off, mate. And it's a fucking analogy. I'm just using an example of what I'm what I'm trying to explain. So I had to phone her up and say, look, I'm sorry. You know, she dropped it. So pulled the police off. And um, got to pay the fucking fine. And to this day, mate, I've never paid it. So I'm still banned from every aspect of non-league fucking football and they will never get that money off me, mate. That was the end of my career. Do you regret the past that you had been involved with, you involved in, and maybe you could have took a managerial career that it could have potentially took off? Because your past always comes back and bites you in the ass to a certain extent. Massively, mate. I've had it with, I've had it with like non-league football, jobs, stuff like that. And it comes back and bites you. But you've got to take that route, mate, haven't you? Like, for everything I've lost through my past, I've gained so much more because I've turned it round. You know, I like to think fully reformed and rehabilitated football nuisance. That's my Twitter thing, you know. I think that people say I'm a son, so fully reformed, rehabilitated football nuisance. It's introduced me to the likes of yourselves, ex-players on the circuit who we've we've managed to work with again. You know, I've been since the book come out, probably had far better things happen to me than bad things, if you like. Mm -hmm. And for taking the odd bit of a fucking downer on, on the football, because I don't, I think nowadays it's gone all badges and you've got to do all, I don't think I've ever been asked with that, mate. I like the, the, you know, the crack with the lads and the management side of it and that, but I don't think I'd have been asked sitting down in this day and age with all this bollocks that's going on in football now, yeah. trying to be, I wouldn't survive in this day and age, put it that way, mate. Not a fucking <laughs> chance. Especially some dead Tourette's anyway. Well, yeah, not, not only that, but you know what else yeah. is going on, James? You know, you got the women referees and all this kind of thing and that. And I think it's just a fucking recipe for disaster. Like, What about um, going forward for the future, brother? What's the plans? Well, fucking hell, mate. I'm a bit old for it all now, aren't I? So hopefully I've got the book coming out next year. Um, I've got a couple of shops now, mate. I've got a good memorabilia shop over the water there. Um, I do all right, mate. I, did, I was doing well on the sports promotions until COVID come in. You know, I've had some great, some great times on that. I've done all the ex-footballers and that. I was Frank Bruno's Northwest agent for about six months. You know, that was fantastic. Worked with Big Joe Egan. I've seen him on your show. We've done stuff with Mike Tyson and 
Frank Bruno's coming on as well. He's getting a new book out. Frank's coming on as he, uh, yeah. Frank's a great fella, mate. Honestly, I, w- I wouldn't say me and Frank fell out because he was going through a bad time of his life, mate. Mental health. I, and I hope, I hope he watches this because I don't think I've ever told him this, mate. Frank, when I was working with him, could have still fought, mate. He probably still could now. Phys- physically wise, he's still a fucking unit, mate. And he used to stay in the hotel by ours and train and that. But he needed that little tablet for his bipolar, and I think he didn't like taking it because he didn't think he needed it. But fucking hell, every day he was sacking us. He was sacking his driver. He was fucking hell, I don't know, ordering 500 conifer trees because he thought the press were looking at him and shit like that. And um, But fucking hell, mate, he's honestly one of the most nicest people you could ever wish to meet, to work with in them and do anything for you, mate. A quick example, mate. We had a do in Rochdale, and he always used to say, I've never been here, are you going to meet us there? And I'd say, Frank, I can't meet you there tonight, mate. It's my mum's 85th birthday. And she lived in a sheltered accommodation, and I said, I can't, mate, I've got to go to this little party. He said, well, what if I pick you up? I said, I'll tell you what, you pick us up and just come in and say happy birthday. He said, I'll fucking be there, gave him the address. And I had to say to this woman in the sheltered accommodation, listen, there'll be a fella coming about half an hour in a big car part where the ambulance is, but you'll only be here 10 minutes and we'll fuck off. Don't tell anyone. She said, who is it? I can't let it happen. I said, well, it's fucking Frank Bruno. She said, all right, okay, no problem. I'm fucking hell, mate. She must have told about 200 fucking people. So the next minute, this fucking big red Bentley comes up into this fucking estate with all masonettes and every fucking woman was on the balconies with the babies and all that. And Frank turns up. Andy, you all right? Yeah. He said, fucking hell. He said, haven't they seen a Bentley before? I said, Frank, it's in Flint. They've never seen a black fella. And he was like, who, 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 fucking good. Anyway, he came in, mate, and he spent an hour in there with everybody. And nothing was too much trouble. And that that's the kind of fucking level of the fella. Nothing too much trouble for him. And I'm, do you know what? I'm so happy for him that he's exercised his demons a bit, if you like, and he's had the proper help he needed. Because not long after we stopped working together, I think he got sectioned in the knee and stuff like that. And, and, um, and it, things like that happen. And he's a, he's he's an absolute top top yeah. fella. Like, what's your best memory at Everton? At Everton, best memory. Oh, there's a couple. Fella Billy Kenny, you know, had a good game against fucking Liverpool oh, once. <laughs> <laughs> um, the best the best memory at Goodison, I think. Everyone mentions the Bayern Munich game when we we beat Bayern Munich three one to get to the final of the Cup Winners' Cup. One of the greatest nights. But as a kid. I was always a big fan of Bob Latsford and, and he got 30 goals once against in one season. And um, he, he beat Chelsea and I, I was there as a kid that day and stuff like that. You're just memories as a kid forever, aren't they? But I got back in in the end. Uh, I had to go every year, James. They had to put a fucking appeal in after about five years. And then my solicitor, you know, solicitors are fucking vultures, mate, aren't they? I'd get letters off solicitors saying, you know, can you, you can appeal against this, you can do this, you can do that and all this. And... I was like, well, I'll fucking do it. And they were getting paid, weren't they? And then I'd have to go there, my fucking shirt and tie on. I was like that fella off Shawshank, Red. Remember, he goes in every year and he uh, talks a load of bollocks and then, yeah, yeah. boom, rejected, mm-hmm. rejected. And there was a fella, mate, at this fucking Ray Foy. And we were at, we were at Liège in the Cup. And I've done the, I've done the, um, the, the flights with Everton and the trips abroad. And we took this fucking coach, took coaches to coaches to Liège. And we had these vests on here to help, just because we had to have them to go on the boat. But the fucking fella that printed them put a UEFA badge on them. And we were by the ground, and this fucking police coming, this Ray Foy had pointed me out, and, he's, and they fucking got me, mate, and they, they fucking ripped this vest off me, locked me up overnight in, in, in Belgium for faking to be a UEFA fucking steward. And it was nonsense, mate. It was just a mistake by the printer. We were just trying to, anyway, fucking use them. And I went to this appeal and I was like the first one. And he said, do you not know who I am, do you? And I went, no, he said, I'm the fella you were calling all sorts and telling to fuck off in the age. The other, sorry about that, mate. Rejected, rejected. And then after 10 years, I went back again. I never gave up on it, mate. I went in, but I just started taking my daughter and I was having to take her to the turnstile and hand her over the turnstile to her uncle going in. And it was dead sad, mate. I said, why can't you come in, dad, and all this? And then... Um, Fucking one game. I got a call and you got to go into Everton. And this Ray Foy fella got me in. He went, we watched you on the CCTV last week. Um, we thought you were going in. They were ready to nick you. But 
what you did was been spot on with your daughter. I said, yeah. He goes, right, that's from Saturday. Fucking clear the decks and you're back in. Like, I fucking made up. I thought, I couldn't understand that. And then about six weeks later, he died. He knew he was ill. And I think he was just wanted to fucking clear the decks, you know, and so I was back in. Um, the only thing was the daft thing. I had to sign a behavioural record and go in a non-risk area. So I got in touch with one of the lads. He said, can you get us a couple of tickets in the director's box? He said, yeah, fucking hell. A couple of grand each and that for the rest of the season. And I've gone in and I've turned up with my daughter on the Saturday. And the stewards are like, yeah, fuck off, you're not coming in here, you fucking soft twat. So I said, yeah, look, it's fucking... And they went on the radios and that, and they're like, fucking hell, they So I think they meant the family stand, but I've gone in the director's box, got lounge seats. I've been there ever since, and I didn't enjoy it. Do a lot of work still with the, with the community, not so much with the former Players Foundation, but I still do a lot with Everton in the community, and we do the dinners and that, mate. And, and it's good, you know, I still do an awful lot with charity work. You know, I'm not... Yeah. Just what I like doing, mate. Right, I really yeah, like right. doing it. How hard is it to stop the fighting? Um, How hard really is it? Like, I, I, go... I, I tell you now, mate. I won't. I won't go to games that I think there might be a bit of trouble, mate. I won't go to them because you never know if you're going to get, you know, pulled in or recognised. Another downside of the book shit is that you know you, you go to places. Fucking hell, mate. I remember going to Newcastle and one of the Newcastle lads were banned, and we got on with them, you know, and he's like, "Come and meet us for a drink." And then we met to play Jasmine, I think it was called. And then we fucked off into town after. He said, go to this fella's pub, Test Man, in the Adelphi. He look after you till we get down. And I went there and then, fucking hell, mate, it was a nightmare. They fucking wanted to kill me. And he was, this one fella was reading past, shouting past his, look at this, what he's put, Tess, fucking we're wankers and that. And he said, you better get out, mate. You're fucking nearly killed. Another time went to Birmingham and come right on top there, fucking hell. I was in the executive box and they were going to come through the fucking door. What's this twat doing here, you know? I was with the likes of Howard Kendall, Bob Latchford, Barry Arn, ex. It was like a day for ex-Birmingham and ex-Everton players. And the steward said, you're going to have to fuck off here, mate. You're going to get killed here in a minute. So it can be dodgy, you know, if people... And you go other places and they say, hi, mate. I went to Man United the other week, took my daughter in the box with some of Man United's old heads. And they're fucking brilliant. You know, lads, you just fucking crack on me, forget on, don't we? But, um... Nah, if there's any chance of it being a bit iffy somewhere, mate, I stay well clear now. What do you think about uh, firms now, a days, compared to 80s, 90s? <sighs> I mean, it's, it's a lot bit more, not change, mate, and I, I won't disrespect anybody by saying, you know, it, it's 22 years, 20 years too late, 30 years too late, like the foreign parts which are emulated, but the lads now who were, who, were, who were getting nicked, they're going to jail for, for long periods and their lives can be ruined, can't they, for... And the chances of getting away with it are fucking zero, really, nowadays. What's London the most CCTV per square mile in the world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What chance? You know, I lost a few mates to trouble at West Ham a few years ago. You know, two and a half years of fucking silly scrap outside a pub. You've just got to be very, very careful, mate, haven't they? Yeah. When's the next? When's the book coming out then, Andy? The 20 year anniversary? The book's coming out next. It's about a year away, mate. October, because it's 20 years since then. It's, it's virtually finished, mate. There's a few little bits and bobs in it, different stuff. Um, a lot of non-football stuff, you know, like the stuff, some of the stuff we just spoke mm. about. The growing up, the the um, the dinners, the people you work with and that, you know, and, and things like that. The trips, you know, the, the the travel company. You know, it was a place in London we we used to hire for the like the for the the Wembley game, Silver Spoons. You know, we had some fucking laughs there. Like, um, used to rent that place off an Indian guy, Mister Singh, bless him. Eight grand you had to pay him, but you got two thousand in and a tenner. And that's fucking good money, you know. Um, that went tits up. We were renting out to too many teams. I think her name. She's in. She's the top woman in the police now. Chris is a dick or something, isn't her name? I remember one day we were there. Southampton against Carlisle, we rented it, and she come and shut the place down. And I, she had the fucking big motorbikes in front of her, little flag in the front of the car, and I said, Officer, why have you shut the fucking club down? And she said, uh, address me as ma'am, please, if you want me to answer it. And I went, oh, sorry, ma'am, why have you shut it? She said, one, I don't like the fucking shithole, and two, known criminals are making money out of it. I said, well, how do you work known criminals are? She said, my intelligence tells us known criminals are making money. I said, well, Mr. Crispin, top lad, Eddie Crispin, Portsmouth, put us onto this. I said, he's a member of the England Supporters Club. He's not here today. He's Portsmouth and Southampton. 
So she's on the radio and she went, no, it's, um, my intelligence tells me there's a Mr. Nichols involved in it. And I've got me fucking bag here full of money and I'm saying, oh, right, I'm off. And then the next minute, the fella on the motorbike, ma'am, that is Mr. Nichols. Right, come back here. And she gave me a fucking bollocking mate and said, get the fuck off my patch now. I'll be fucking in, in touch with you, fucking HMRC and all this. Fucking clear off. And that was the end of that. Another fucking door shut. <laughs> Another one opens, doesn't it? Yeah. But um, it's been eventful, you know. And then I'm trying to do... My daughter was very, very poorly the last two years, mate. She's had some terrible troubles. Um, and we're raising money for the hospitals and the, the McDonald house and all the hay. You know, they saved their life. Um, so just stuff like that, mate. Now we were doing yeah. that. And like we say, every time we, we come on here, you know, we, we lad these things, we're talking about mental health. And that's never so been so big. And, you know, I think through this lockdown, mate, fucking hell, I know three people who, who took their own lives. And it's sad, you know, it's, 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 it's fucking horrible, mate. And I think men now have got to, you know, they've got to own up to their problems, mate. Big, hard, fucking tough men are, are, are I found hanging from trees because they don't like talking to people. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going up these mountains now, walking for charity, and I've got different people coming with me because the first couple I did, I'd see loads of women coming down with the dogs and chatting happy and fucking, and then you just see fellas walking up on their own with the fucking heads. You think, fucking hell, mate, you're morning, you see him. You think, he's got fucking problems with him. So I put it out there. If anyone fucking wants to come up with us in the morning, come up. And... Fucking hell, mate, the response is unbelievable. People coming up and some of the stuff they're telling you. You couldn't believe it. Just because it's a little offer, a little olive branch, come on, mate, open up. And people after they got in touch, can I come up again? Next, feel much better for telling you. I think just, it, it's horrendous, mate. This day and age now, mental health with fellas, it's just it's fucking heartbreaking, mate. Yeah, it's through the roof, man, and it's sad that people are too scared to speak out but as soon as you speak out that's when you can start to yeah. get the help to then you know what? don't life. get me wrong mate when my, when my daughter was in hospital i was driving through the tunnel me missus used to stay there every night with her you know and we had horrendous nights there mate you know what you'd never want to hear mate and i wouldn't wish it on anyone you know the surgeon there's basically said look tonight i'm going to be phoning you up and saying all you're going to hear is it's good news that means i've saved a life or it's bad news that means come and see us Basically, she's gone, and I'm thinking, you know, you don't want that, mate. You don't want anyone to hear that. Fortunately enough, three in the morning, the phone went. It's good news. We managed to sort the problem out. Big, massive burst, stomach ulcer she had. We've stopped the bleeding, the artery, saved her life. And he just went, you can thank me again, and put the fucking phone down. I'm like, fucking hell, you know. And she'd been through hell and back my daughter with it, mate. And affected her massively. You know, she lost two years of school. This Christmas is the first year. She's back home with us at Christmas for three years, mate. So if that can affect kids and they're not particularly getting that much help, imagine people who have suddenly, in this, what's gone on now, I've got no one to turn to, have they? And I'm thinking to myself, fucking hell, mate, you know, just by chatting to someone going up on a fucking hill walk, could, could have saved their life. Yeah, yeah. Not just change their life, James. Mm -hmm. You could save their lives, mate. Yeah. And I just think, I don't know, and it's always been there. How many in the past have, like, I think we spoke, mate. If, if the likes of Robin Williams can kill himself, mate, someone as fucking funny and happy and as successful as him, anyone can make, can't they? Yeah, because we never know what's within. And I just think there should be something there, mate, for, 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 for men to get rid of the stigma of, I don't want to talk about it, suffering in silence, and then it's too fucking late, mate. Yeah, that's a hard thing. But again, guys like yourself doing these kind of walks, and you, all your past, everything that you go through, you realise it's all fucking irrelevant. When you, know, it really... you, you know, it is, mate. I, I think to people, fucking hell, mate. You know, I've, I've no pleasure from saying, mate, I've been to jail, I've been in some awful trouble, I've done some awful bad things in my life, I've done all sorts of good things. I don't think, you know, I've, I've been through that with, with me, me, me daughter, God bless her. You know, I've lost both my parents, luckily enough. I managed to spend an awful lot of time with them before they both passed away. My dad before the book come out, you know, and I'm, I still, one of my biggest regrets of this life is I never ever had the chance to tell my dad I was sorry. And he never really seen the good I did in my life after he passed away. He passed away just before I brought the book out. My mum, luckily enough, she passed away six years ago last week. And she saw a lot of good come out of my life. She saw the grandkids. She saw me rebuild my life and and come good and have a lot of good press for a lot of the good things I did. 
you know, and I, I just wish my dad could have seen that really. And, and that, that saddens me, but it doesn't sadden me enough to, to think there's, there's no fucking way out of all this, whereas a lot of people just do not see an avenue out of some of the shitholes they get themselves into and, 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 the, and the messes they do. And there always mm. is a way out, mate, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. Fucking money, shit, you know, mm -hmm. drugs, get away from it. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of it's to do with, with you know, relationship problems. Um, get drugs, social media, drugs, so many social, social media is a fucking evil thing, mate. Mm -hmm. An evil, evil thing, mate. And people have to be thick skinned and that, but no one, you know, imagine a school kid. I mean, I, I've no doubt, and when this goes out, you'll have a like, people say, this big stupid twat doesn't know what he's talking about. All over social media, fucking bother me, mate. I'm looking thick skinned and I've had it all before. But some kid in school tries to do a little blog or something and they get fucking battered, you know, and. Sad, mate. It's just, you know, what the fucking hell? There's no escape from, is there? You know, and I think that's why that social media thing, and Tony Bellew at the nail on the end, mate, the other week when he said everybody should be registered with a fucking driving license or a passport and their address bill to say where they're doing it from, mate. Yeah. And then they could just go around their fucking houses and say, well, have you just fucking done this shit, what? Definitely, yeah. man. For anybody that's maybe watching and struggling with mental health, Andy, what, what advice would you have for them? Anyone struggling with mental health, mate, there's, there's no shame in it, mate. There is no shame. I've seen firsthand how, how it can can break, take a family to breaking point. But there's no shame in it. You know, I'll be honest, mate. I've come home from that hospital through the tunnel, going back to my other daughter. And I never, I'm nowhere near close enough to feel as, as bad as some people have. But odd days when I've come there, I thought, you know, if this tunnel collapsed on me now, I wouldn't give a fuck because my life's that sad at the moment. I wouldn't ever think I'm going to drive off a bridge or jump off a cliff. But at times I would think, Do you know, if that just fucking fell into my head, I wouldn't give a fuck because I feel so shit. But you get yourself together, you regroup, talk to people. And it's it's something they've got to do, mate. You know, you've, you've, got, to, you've got to put it out there. There's no fucking shame in it anymore, mate. Just, you know, it's a stigma about weakness and that with men. What the fuck's weak about saying to your mate, can I have a chat? Can we, you know, let's, let's fucking walk up hill. Yeah. Don't sit in the fucking pub on your own lashing fucking Jack Daniels down. You're feeling sorry for yourself. And then wake up the morning and do it again. Say to someone to tell you, what you fancy, fancy going for a fucking walk? Fancy doing this, that and the other. It's there, mate. There's enough people who listen, enough people understand you anymore. There's no, it's not underground anymore, is it, mental health? It's there for you, mate. And, and anyone, anybody can suffer from it. Let's make no mistake by that. You know, you in in in, in three months' time, you, you could feel like fucking something could happen that triggers it off, mate. Once that hamster starts running either too fast or slow or running the wrong way, you can be fucked in a matter of weeks. Tell someone about it. Don't go the wrong way. Don't make the wrong decisions because there's a lot of good people out there who can help you. And that's, you know, I know firsthand on that, mate. I've lost good friends through depression, suicide, and I've, and I've seen mental health firsthand and, it's a fucking vile, evil disease, mate. Yeah, that's that. Andy boy. James, listen. Coming on day, brother. Absolute pleasure, yeah, mate. Likewise. And, Thanks uh, very much, pal. Can't wait to read your second book, man. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. God bless you, brother. Take Thank care, you. pal. Thank Bye. you.